Bill Clinton, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln. What do they have in common? They're all politicians. Picasso, Michelangelo, Raphael, what do they have in common? They're all artists with difficult names. What do Barack Obama, Michael Jordan, and Kanye West all have in common? <laughs> They're American, you racists. <laughs> Muhammad, Jesus, Buddha, religious leaders. Einstein, Darwin, Newton, Galileo, Stephen Hawking. They're all famous scientists. And what does everyone on these lists have in common? They're all men. Every single last one of them is male. You probably didn't notice they were all men because we've gotten so used to our world's masculine bias that we don't even notice anymore. It's like a subtle buzzing sound in the background that you don't even hear until someone points it out. Can, can you hear that? That we could hear 20 male names in a row and not think those are all men. Time Magazine recently did a ranking of the 100 most influential people in history, and guess how many were women? Three. Three out of 100. Three women, 97 guys. Elvis Presley was on the list. Apparently only three women in history are as influential as the king. <laughs> Not a single woman from the 20th century is on the list, but the guy who sang Viva Las Vegas. He's the big time. Either history was really sexist, or our telling of history is really sexist, or Time Magazine is really sexist. It's probably a bit of all three. I was reading through Time's list with someone, and they were like, Hey, I found another woman! Her, her name's Renee! And I'm like, Renee Descartes? <laughs> Guy. <laughs> he continued, well, What about right here? Louise. Louis the Fourteenth. <laughs> Guy. <laughs> See, whereas boys have an entire history of male artists, writers, politicians, architects, lawyers, or athletes to look up to and that stand as an example that they can be whoever they want to be, in contrast, girls are birthed into a world where great women are not held up and celebrated, and those that are are few and far between. Carol Shields calls this a withholding universe, a universe girls are born into and quickly realize they don't totally belong in a universe that's withholding something from them. There's a cultural cap on the value and importance of a female life. They can be good, but they can't be great. Whereas men have millions of stars to look up at and be inspired by, the lights guiding a female in this universe are few and far between, constantly eclipsed in our past and present by those telling the story. As you've probably heard before, history is told by the winners. And AD history, Anno Domini history, history in the year of our Lord, is no different. In 1980, 86% of Western historians were men. And that number's improved a bit since then, but if you're a man and you're wondering who the winners of history were, you can stop looking around. We won history. We Are the Champions is playing somewhere off in the background. Can you hear it? Our world is always seen from the perspective of those telling the story, and overwhelmingly, men have been the ones telling the story. But obviously, sexism isn't just something in our history, in our past. A major study by the World Health Organization found that in most countries, between 30 and 60 percent of women had experienced physical or sexual violence by a husband or boyfriend. Women aged 15 through 44 are more likely to be maimed or die from male violence than from cancer, malaria, traffic accidents, and war combined. Furthermore, as Naomi Wolf notes, during the past decade in North America, women breached the power structure and finally got some control. Meanwhile, eating disorders rose exponentially and cosmetic surgery became the fastest growing medical specialty. During the past five years, consumer spending doubled, 
Pornography became the main media category ahead of legitimate films, and 33,000 American women just told researchers they would rather lose 10 to 15 pounds than accomplish any other goal. More women have more money and power and scope and legal recognition than ever before, but in terms of how we feel about ourselves, we may actually be worse off than our unliberated grandmothers. End quote. Of course, few people in North America would outright say women are less valuable than men, but it's not always the outright obvious, loud, spoken statements that really shape the world. No, it's the quiet, subtle stuff going on in the background. Like the ability to hear a list of 20 famous people and not realize they're all male. How many of you noticed? It's the quiet, subtle assumptions that make the difference. The ones that are placed before you every day that you cease to even notice. That buzzing that is so gentle in the background, you eventually forget it's even there. Can you hear it? So let me ask you another question. What do these people have in common? What do Cleopatra, Indira Gandhi, Eleanor Roosevelt, Margaret Thatcher, Princess Diana, Mother Teresa, Mary Magdalene, Anne Frank, Teresa of Avila, Madame Curie, Florence Nightingale, Susan B. Anthony, Hypatia, Emily Dickinson, Helen Keller, Virginia Woolf, Maya Angelou, J.K. Rowling, Catherine the Great, Catherine of Siena, Oprah Winfrey, Hillary Clinton, Jane Austen, Amelia Earhart, Gloria Steinem, the Virgin Mary, Madeleine Albright, and Rosa Parks have in common? They weren't on Time Magazine's list. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So if you remember, we started our journey down here in 8033 with Jerusalem, and then Paul brought the gospel eventually up here into Asia Minor, and then over to Philippi, where he was put in jail, and then he went from Philippi down to Thessalonica, where him and Jason were accused of worshiping Jesus over Julius Caesar. And then they made that trip down to Athens, where Paul confronted reason and Athena, and now, he's traveled the 36 to 37 mile trip to Corinth, where he meets a guy named Aquila, who's recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. If you notice, the narrator lists the guy first, then his wife second, because in ancient customs, the more respected person is always listed first. And the more respected person was always the man. And it's not just women, but it's, it's also children, slaves, the handicapped or sick who'd be listed last because they were considered secondary, less important, less valuable, less respectable, less human in ancient civilization. So, as per the ancient custom, the Bible lists Aquila first and, oh yeah, forgot about her, I think he got married, his wife, she's coming too, the old ball and chain, he lists her second, the Bible lists the man first, and the woman second. Is God a sexist pig? Acts 18, after this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, there he met a Jew named Aquila, and who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, We're moving on. Every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue in Corinth, trying to persuade Jews, and, you know, we're just going to... What happens here is what happens every time Paul goes someplace in the book of Acts. He goes and preaches about Jesus, a bunch of people get pissed off about him, they put him in prison, get him in trouble, and then somehow miraculously he escapes, and we all learn a valuable life lesson. So let's just skip to verse 18 and ignore the story. <laughs> Paul stayed on in court for some time. So this is after the story has occurred. Paul stayed on in court for some time. Then he left and he sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos came. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He began to speak boldly 
In the synagogue, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So there's this dude, his name's Aquila, and he's apparently pretty awesome. But did you notice the story going on underneath the main story? The quantum shift going on in the background. Priscilla is listed before Aquila. The wife is listed before the husband, the woman before the man, not just once as if it were an accident, three times in a row within about two or three sentences. The Bible introduced us to Aquila and Priscilla in the normal, normal customary sexist way, but then it reverses it. It plays the game for a second so it could then undermine the game. And you might not appreciate this today because we don't have this ordering system, but back then, people would have been reading it and gone, what, what the, why is she listed first? They would have just stopped. I mean, it's, it's like if, if you saw an African American riding on the front of the bus today, you wouldn't be shocked about that, right? It's 2015. But if you saw an African American riding on the front of the bus in 1950, when they weren't allowed to, it would have been a big deal like when Rosa Parks did it, and she made the front page of every newspaper. You might not get it now, but back then, this was a major statement. It even says she invited Apollos into her home and explained to him the way of God more adequately, which back then was a big no-no. Women didn't publicly correct men back then, but the Bible gives absolutely zero craps about what people did back then. Priscilla will go on to become one of the most respected women in the early church. This is just the beginning. In Romans 16, Paul will call a woman named Phoebe a deacon, and a woman named Junia an apostle, both which are like right up at the top. Those are like the top possible authoritative positions you can have. The next is like, okay, you're God, but only mm -hmm. Jesus gets that one. Uh, dozens of times in the Bible, women will become prophets and teachers, evangelists, patrons, and church hosts. The early Christians gave women a level of dignity and power and authority unprecedented in the ancient world. This just didn't happen back then. But isn't religion actually oppressive to women? Sometimes it has been. Yeah. Religious people have done some pretty horrible things against womankind. And sometimes they've even tried to use the Bible to justify it. I'm going to share a verse with you. Most pastors skip this verse and just preach on something else because it's less scary. I think you can handle it. You're smart enough to wrestle with it for yourself. The text is 1 Corinthians 14, so it's actually a letter Paul later wrote back to the people in Corinth, who he visits today in Acts 18. Corinth, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that's how we got the name of the book, Corinthians. This is the letter Paul wrote to them. 1 Corinthians 14. Women should remain silent in church. They are not allowed to speak. If they want to inquire about something, they should wait until they are at home to ask. Is God a sexist pig? Let me give you a history of my relationship with 1 Corinthians 14. The first time I heard it, I said, yes, awesome, do what I say, woman. <laughs> I was five at the time. <laughs> and this piece of religious propaganda greatly assisted me in keeping girls out of my pillow fort. <laughs> When I was older, probably around 10, I, I ran across this verse again, and it, it troubled me this time. I actually paused and I went and reread it. It didn't seem fair. But I, I guess I was 10, so at that age I was still willing to trust that somehow God made sense of it in some way. There must be something I'm missing. Somehow it makes sense. So I just sort of left it. And then when I turned 15, I came across this verse again, and I think my thoughts were something like, Yep, the Bible is a load of crap. I suspected it before, but this proves it. It's a bunch of misogynistic, sexist, mindless bogus. Then when I was around 20 years old, 
I discovered something. A few chapters earlier in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says women should pray out loud in church. So within seconds of each other, Paul both says that women can and can't speak in church. So unless Paul has like the worst memory of all time, something else is going on here. Perhaps 1 Corinthians 14 doesn't actually mean what it at first seems to mean. So I started reading more. And I discovered there were actually a number of different possible interpretations of this verse. One is that Paul isn't even talking about speaking in general, but speaking in tongues, which is sort of a personal prayer where you talk to God using random syllables, almost like an invented language. As you can imagine, 30 people speaking in tongues out loud at once in a church service would be quite chaotic. Paul's like, just shut up, stop speaking in tongues. And that would make sense because the entire section that Paul is talking about here, he's talking against speaking in tongues. And then he sort of breaks to talk about women, and then he continues talking about speaking in tongues. So unless this was part of that, it wouldn't make sense. Another interpretation is that because women were not educated back then, they kept asking questions and interrupting the service. Now, women should have been educated back then. They would have done just as well, if not better, from my experience anyway. My sister was valedictorian at UBC. I'm such a disappointment. Um, <laughs> but sadly, in ancient cultures, girls didn't get educated, and the guys did. And so girls, like any uneducated person, male or female, needed a lot of clarification. And this led to interrupting the service by asking each other questions in the audience and making lots of noise, or even just straight up interrupting the speaker to ask a question. This would make sense of why Paul then says, wait until you are at home to ask your questions. Now, these interpretations have their flaws, but I began to realize that the anti-woman interpretation had even more flaws. And whatever Paul is saying here, he's clearly not saying that women can't speak in church, period, because he literally just told them to speak in church right before this. Something else is going on. And that helped to answer some of my doubts about the Bible. I mean, I know you guys have had this moment when you're reading for the Bible, or you're flipping through it randomly, or you see a meme on the internet, and you go, is that in the Bible? And you just freak out, and it's like, well, there goes 20 years of committed faith. And I wanted to tell you my story with this verse, because notice that it spanned almost 20 years from since I was five. I want to encourage you, when you first see something you don't understand, don't just freak out. Trust God for a bit, and maybe go ask someone what it might mean. Take the time to actually pick up a book, perhaps or pick up an iPad if that's easier, and buy a book on the iPad. Some people give up so quickly on their faith. It was a 20-year journey for me, but I, I got closure. And you know what ultimately settled the question for me? How Jesus treats women. In Luke 10, Jesus is at the house of two sisters. The one sister, Martha, is cooking and cleaning, while the other sister, Mary, is sitting and listening to Jesus teach as if she were a student, which at the time, women were not allowed to be religious rabbis' students. So Martha, she gets mad at her sister Mary and says, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be in the kitchen helping with me like a good girl. And Jesus literally interrupts her and says, no, she's right where she belongs. Here with me learning. In John 8, men capture a woman in the act of adultery. Note that they did nothing to the man in the situation. They catch a woman caught in adultery, and they throw her at Jesus' feet, and they say, we're going to stone this woman. What do you say? And Jesus says, whoever is without sin may throw the first stone. I do not condemn her. And thus, Jesus became the first person in history to fight back against slut-shaming. True story. 
In Middle Eastern culture, many priests and teachers refuse to even go near women. But Jesus spent all of his time hanging out with women and everyone else considered secondary in ancient society, like prostitutes, the sick, the homeless, children, and slaves. The Bible says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither male nor female, slave or free person, Jew or Gentile, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you want to know how Christianity grew from a few dozen fishermen in AD 33 to a few million people in a very short period of time? Because Christians accepted everyone into the church. Men, women, children, slaves, Jews, Gentiles, poor, rich, sick, healthy, every. One. Another major religion at the time was Mithraism, but Mithraism excluded women, slaves, and non-Romans from joining. And so it soon died because it excluded more than half the population of the world. By opening the doors wide to everyone, Christianity tapped into a previously unexplored market. In ancient society, your value was based on your status, your class, how respected you were. So if you were a slave, a woman, a child, or handicapped, you were considered less valuable, less human. But Christians came in and said that God created all people equal. All people have inherent value. God loves everyone, including women, slaves, and children. To illustrate the contrast, in the Roman Empire at the time, it was quite common for people to take newborn children that were deformed or were female, or simply unwanted, and it was legal to leave the baby in the sewers to die because they were not considered useful to society. And so they were considered non-human. And Christians became the first group to systematically go and collect the babies, take them in, and raise them themselves. Society saw these babies as worthless because they were too young to do anything useful, and because female babies wouldn't grow up and make as much money as men. But Christians believed every human was created by God and loved by God, regardless of how useful they are, or where they're from, or what class or race or gender they are. Christianity caused a revolution in how humanity thought about itself, how we think about each other. You might assume it is self-evident that all humans are created equal. We live in a world where for centuries we have heard that over and over again. Equality has been hammered into us, so we don't even think about it anymore. We just assume it's always been common sense. But it wasn't common sense, which is why the vast majority of human cultures never developed a system of equality and human rights. If you went back in time to that time period and said that all people were created equal, they wouldn't even really understand what you were saying. They would say, look around you, that person was born strong and beautiful and that person was born ugly and sick and weak. They're clearly not created equal. That's just common sense. Use your eyes. See, in the Western world, it wasn't until Christianity came along that our understanding of human equality began to take shape, and we began to see men and women as both made, loved, and valued by God. Now, obviously not all Christians are feminists. Some of them are very anti-feminists, and most modern feminists are not Christians. But if the Christian revolution did not happen, it is a matter of history that feminism in the West would not have happened, or at least it would not have happened when it did. True, when equality and human rights became popular in the Enlightenment, not all its proponents were Christians, but what they were saying would never have made sense culturally if Christianity had not been laying the philosophical groundwork for it for thousands of years and slowly revolutionizing culture from the ground up. Remember that popular prayer from the ancient world? Thank you, God, for not making me a woman, a slave, a Gentile, or a dog. People back then prayed that. And Christianity came into that world and said in Galatians 3, there's neither male nor female, slave or free, Jew or Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus started a cultural revolution by introducing the radical notion that God created and loves all people equally, including slaves, beggars, foreigners, girls, and women. Let us live up to the example of Jesus. Let us live up to the example of Priscilla and Aquila and the Corinthian church that we're okay with that happening. Let us rethink how we think so we're no longer allowing men to dominate our worldview, no longer allowing men alone to tell us the story of AD history, but bringing men and women together to create a more mutual picture of our past, present, and future. Let us light up the night sky with the bright stars of women and other underrepresented people groups so that all children everywhere can look up in our universe and know they can be somebody, but more importantly, that they already are somebody. They are already loved and valued and cherished by God. Let us live up to the example set by those first Christians. We've drifted from it many times throughout history, but let us get back to it. Let us go out and serve all people, regardless of their status, race, background, class, or gender, loving and valuing them as God loves and values them.